Five years ago, ticks and tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease were a downstate problem. But now, ticks are widespread throughout the North Country and Adirondacks and making people sick. In fact, the increase has been so dramatic, some people are calling it a public health crisis. So for the last and that's years, what filled the Whalensburg Grange Hall in late June, even the balcony seats, as more than 100 people came to hear from Paul Smith biologist Leanne Sporn, who has been tracking the spread of ticks into the Adirondacks for several years. So in, especially in the Adirondacks, climate change, warmer and wetter, is likely the driving force for the northward expansion of ticks into our region, and it really is dramatic. What I've seen over the past five years is really astounding. Dr. Sporn says many never saw the rapid spread of ticks and tick-borne illnesses coming. People aren't prepared. Um, physicians aren't looking to diagnose tick-borne diseases. Many of you are aware of that. And Dr. Keith Collins, a specialist in infectious disease at CVPH Medical Center in Plattsburgh, says even the medical community was caught by surprise. Um, when I was in training at UVM in 1998 as an infectious disease fellow, I was told there's no tick-borne illnesses in this area. I was told not to even consider it, uh, that it was a zebra and I should be looking for horses. All I can tell you now is tick-borne illnesses here are now horses. The two doctors have appeared together at events like this to try to raise awareness in the community. And Dr. Leanne Sporn and Dr. Keith Collins join us now along with Susan Allen, who is the Director of Public Health Preventive Services in Essex County. Thank you all for being here. Welcome. It's nice to have you. Leanne, we just heard you say after that presentation that it's critical to raise awareness about the danger and the diseases that the ticks carry. Are people becoming more aware of, of how much of a tick danger there is now? Well, I think our efforts are starting to change the, the culture and the lore that, you know, historically this was an area with no, no ticks and no risk of tick-borne disease. And I hope that our efforts uh, out in the field are showing that there is a local risk. So we're trying our best to get the word out. And your annual surveys show the growth. How much of a Absolutely. growth has there been? So when we started this in 2014, we really were hard pressed to find ticks in the Adirondack region, except maybe along the shores of Lake Champlain. But in the six years that, that followed that, we've seen an amazing expansion, both of the range geographically and also the ticks moving up into higher elevations. So now there's a risk throughout the, throughout the region. So when you talk about raising awareness, you want to let people know the ticks are out there. Yes. If they believe they've been bitten by a tick, they need to see a doctor. Yes, so we know the ticks are out there. We also not what, know what diseases they harbor. And so initially it was just Lyme disease, and now that list has grown from Lyme disease to anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Powassan virus. And those are diseases that probably a lot of people don't know about, but obviously right. there's reason to be concerned that yes. they're carrying those diseases. That's Lyme right. disease can be debilitating. Those diseases can be quite dangerous as well. Yes. The ticks that you're seeing are the overwhelming majority carrying Lyme disease or are they carrying all of these diseases? About half of the ticks that we, um, that we collect, at least the adult ticks, carry Lyme and a, a smaller percentage carry the other diseases, but up to 10% are shown to carry anaplasmosis and babesiosis. And many ticks in some locations carry all three diseases. And Keith and Susan, people know the classic red bullseye, that if they see that, that means that they probably have been bitten by a tick. Yes, the classic bullseye is a, a symptom that we all look for, but in um, many cases there is no bullseye and there are no symptoms initially. The patient just starts feeling tired and just maybe not just right. Uh, so uh, the classic bullseye actually will give a positive diagnosis of Lyme disease, but without that, then the person might go through testing and or present to a physician with symptoms, and the physician may, you know, uh, get the testing or have them treated. Doctors are becoming more open-minded to the fact that they may be seeing tick bites and the diseases that the ticks can carry. I think we're getting there. Um, I also would just say that the, even when you see the bullseye rash, it's the most characteristic of Lyme disease. And remember that the other tick infections we're talking about don't necessarily have a rash at all, and they're on the rise in our area too. But just to address the rash issue for a minute, um, even though the bullseye is the most common, uh, the, the most characteristic, the most common is simply a uh, an area of redness that looks for all the, uh, gets misdiagnosis of cellulitis. Hmm. Um, that happens a lot. That is actually the most common way you'll see uh, Lyme present. 
And it's very important to understand that at that stage, you do diagnose things clinically, not by blood test. And the treatment point. is medicine. Uh, yeah, this treatment is a course of a, a drug called doxycycline in adults. Um, and it's usually somewhere between 10 and 14 days. And Susan, the Essex County Health Department has tick kits that you give out. Tell us a little bit about what those are and what's in them. They are um, a kit with tweezers and alcohol and a little identification card of the ticks in all different stages. And we teach people regarding uh, prevention and awareness. So a you know, if you're going to be outside, then to dress appropriately and or uh, use DEET or permethrin. And then C, if you do have a tick on you, then identify as a tick and take it off properly. And given the growth of the tick population, are doctors within CVPH, UVM, the health network, are they working together and trying to get the word out to all the doctors and to the clinics that, that, that this is something that ought to be considered because at the presentation you talked about how when you were trained 20 plus oh, years yes. ago they said forget about it yes. we, we don't have ticks we don't have Lyme disease don't even think about it correct but that's obviously changed yes absolutely I was chastised in 1998 in my fellowship for even considering the diagnosis what's the UVM Health Network doing oh, it's to try very, to get the word out we're very in tune with it now we have a program called at Project Echo here um, which is um, a telementoring program that tries to teach uh, primary care clinicians about a particular topic, usually we, uh, thought to be, quote, a specialist topic, one of which has been tick-borne infections, and we are now doing a telemedicine uh, project where uh, primary care clinicians are tuning in twice a month, and we talk about a particular case of that's mis there's no identification of the person, and we talk about a case that we think is a tick-borne illness, and we talk about how to diagnose and treat it. The other thing I will say is that our emergency department, at least here at CVPH, has been very much in tune with it, including the fact that it's not just Lyme. They're starting to look for some of the other tick-borne illnesses, and the one we're particularly finding a lot is something called anaplasma that I don't think most people are familiar with, and it, it, it gives you many of the same symptoms as Lyme disease, but without the rash. Um, there are some things in the blood you can look for, and, it's, it's, and it can be diagnosed by blood tests in over 90% of the cases. But we see a lot of that. We've had a lot of people admitted more for anaplasmosis than for Lyme disease this year. Really? Yes. And how dangerous is that? So we had a mortality from anaplasmosis here last year. Um, it's about, classically about a 5% mortality. But again, the same thing you go back to, if they tell you they've got a tick, great. But the majority of people with a tick-borne illness won't be called a tick bite. You have to ask what they've been doing. And that will clue you in, in the proper, you know, in the proper clinical setting, if you've got the symptoms that look like the flu and we're not in flu season, ask about outdoor activity. And that will often clue you in to think about these things. And the, the nice thing too is the treatment is the same. It's a drug called doxycycline. Um, and in fact, for all the tick-borne illnesses, with the exception of Babesia, the, the treatment is the same. It's doxycycline when they're treatable. Well, from my perspective, I'm part of the Project ECHO. I'm sort of a unique member since I'm not a health care provider. But um, I'm able to see that what we're seeing in the field correlates really well with what they're seeing in the clinic. Yes. And like year to year, uh, for example, a case was presented that you said had to travel a long way to see you. And I said, well, do you know where the person came from? He actually came from a site about an hour and a half away where we had just identified anaplasmosis in that tick population. So it makes me feel good that, that what we're seeing does correlate very right. well to the clinic. And one thing that you t let me know that I did not know is that we had Babesia in our ticks here. Babesia yeah. is another illness. It's sort of like a, a malaria-like illness. It infects red blood cells. We've had a case of Babesia here, but it was uh, imported. And But since now that I know the ticks here have them, we are on the lookout for and it And there have much been more. some locally acquired cases. We're, we're pretty sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So your work that you're doing is, I think, vital to the work that we do, yeah. <laughs> which and is with, why we're pairing up. <laughs> with your work being so vital this year, your mm -hmm. funding got cut. Mm -hmm. The state in the past has provided this funding for you to go out and do your surveys. This year it got cut. The legislature didn't come through with right. the money. Right. Uh, many people believe uh, because of the change in, in politics in Albany mm -hmm. and who, who controls the Senate where the money had, yeah. had come from. But that has to be frustrating that at a time when so many people are saying this is so critical to have mm -hmm. this information, you lose your funding. It did, yes. You were able to continue your work this summer through private donations. Actually, this summer I continued the work. Um, the testing is done through a collaboration with the New York State Department of Health. Um, but the work that I did, I did as a volunteer this summer to keep the work going. So since then, uh, in fact, I'm meeting um, 
the, a representative from the Klausbler Foundation next Monday to, to get a check that will fund our work this fall. You're having another event coming up next Wednesday. It's going to be at the Best Western in Ticonderoga, and it'll be from uh, 7 to 9 p.m. on the 11th. And Leanne's going to speak uh, regarding her tick-borne uh, uh, expertise. I will speak regarding public health and our role in prevention and education awareness and surveillance and investigation. And Dr. Collins, of course, is expertise with diagnosis and treatment. So we're excited. We've had a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. And we talk about prevention. Obviously, when you go out in the woods, be prepared, dress accordingly, use DEET, take the steps to mm -hmm. protect yourself. Are there other things that, that we can do? So what we, um, our message is at the health department, exactly what you just said, Tom. And then when you come inside or when you're done in the woods, you shower, you bathe immediately and do a tick check. So you're basically checking, even using a mirror where you can look behind your back. We're actually finding a, a, our greatest number of people infected are 65 and older. Hmm. And we're wondering if potentially it's because they are not thinking about it and they're not looking behind them and maybe you know have spots on their bodies where they're not as in tune to um, the fact that they might be infected. So that tick check is really important. We want to do whatever we can to get the word out through ECHO, through these conferences and trainings through, you know, public airing any mm -hmm. way we can mm -hmm. to increase awareness.